So our next speaker is Andreas Kohl. He started working as an accountant at 16. He is Lieberland's ambassador to Liechtenstein. He lives in Liechtenstein. And he holds four citizenships. He has a French, Spanish, German, and an American citizenship. And he's written an article about Liechtenstein, which went viral in Brazil. And he's a board member of the Advancement for Liberty Foundation. So without further ado, Andreas Kohl. Thank you. So, uh, as Thibault said, I work for the Foundation of, for the Advancement of Liberty, uh, based in Spain. We are a rather new organization that started last year. Um, we work in several um, uh, grounds, um, trying to be an incubator for uh, libertarian movements in Spain. Um, one of our most recent uh, activities has been uh, launching the taxpayers' movement in Spain. And we support um, objectivist organizations and are starting a spexit movement in favor of leaving the European Union. Um, so I'm not here to talk about my foundation. So um, what I'm here to talk to you about, um, in sharp contrast to the last speaker who uh, was sh telling you about one of the countries where it's uh, uh, most difficult to be a libertarian, I want to show you that there is actually an extremely libertarian uh, country in the world. Now, first, let, let me ask you a question. Um, I know I know not all of you are libertarians, but uh, if you are a libertarian, um, have you ever tried to convince someone about your ideas and had the response that um, basically uh, all of this sounds good in theory, uh, but it would never work in the real wor world? But raise your hands if uh, someone uh, said that to you. So that's quite a few of you. Um, well. I want to show you that you have an example of your ideas already working somewhere in the world and that there are many lessons to be learned from this country um, in, in your own, uh, that you can apply to your own act activism in your respective countries. So uh, first let's get us started with um, a quote from uh, Prince Alois. Uh, so he said this in 2005. Um, one year after he started uh, taking over the monarchical duties in Liechtenstein. Uh, so he addressed the country and stated his, uh, his aim, uh, his intention as prince. He said, let us create a country in which to the extent possible, the individuals themselves, not the state, shall make each individual's decisions and decide upon their needs. Now this aim is not new for Liechtenstein. Uh, the princely family has been fighting for this for decades. And I think that's why it's important for us to look at how they've been doing this and what we can learn from this. Um, now, first I'd like to point out that um, a lot of the ideas in this presentation, a lot of the things I'm going to expose you to, and a lot of the quotes you'll see here are from a book called The State in the Third Millennium, written by His Serene Highness, Prince Hans Adam II, uh, Prince Alois's father. Um, so the topic of this book, and indeed the topic of this presentation, is, is to set out the reasons why the traditional state as a monopoly enterprise not only is an inefficient en enterprise with a poor price performance ratio, but even more importantly, becomes more of a danger for humanity the longer it lasts. Uh, so this is a very strong opinion, very st strong statement, but um, you, a lot of you are already convinced about this, and I think as time goes on, the rest of you will start to see the truth in this. Now, th this book I would recommend for all of you, whether you uh, classify yourself as a conservative, uh, uh, libertarian, minarchist, classical liberal, objectivist, anarcho-capitalist like myself. Um, as the prince says, for some the steps in this book will appear too large, for others too small. Yet perhaps in the fourth millennium, humanity may be able to ask the question, why do we need a state at all? And indeed the fight for liberty is a long journey. It's a journey that can span, span across millennia. Um, however, it's important to realize that uh, we don't always go forward in this journey. A lot of countries, uh, like here in Greece, unfortunately, seem to, to sometimes periodically go backwards. And that's why we should look at a country that, that's uh, already very far advanced in this journey and, and inspire ourselves from them. So um, first, in order to, to do this, uh, in order to inspire ourselves from Liechtenstein, I suppose we should probably understand how Liechtenstein works. So as uh, you'll probably have figured out by now, Liechtenstein um, has a monarchy. 
um, in contrast to many monarchies in the world, uh, the monarchy has executive powers. Um, also in contrast to most monarchies, the heir to the throne uh, doesn't get transferred uh, all the duties as a monarch uh, upon the death of his predecessor. Instead, they uh, gradually transfer the uh, powers and responsibilities of the monarch in a transition period, uh, th th which uh, uh, this time has started in 2004. Um, so today, Prince Alois um, fulfills m most of the duties, uh, the day-to-day -day duties of uh, the monarch, even though, even though Prince Hans Adam, the author of the book I mentioned, is still the head of state. So um, there is also a representative uh, democracy. Um, there's a parliament in Liechtenstein uh, that's based in this uniquely shaped building. Um, in order to understand the climate of ideas in, in Liechtenstein, we can get an idea by looking at uh, who's represented in, in that parliament. So there are 10 members from the Progress Progressive Citizens Party, uh, FBP, which is a free market pro-monarchist party, uh, uh, which includes the prime minister. Um, it's the only party in Liechtenstein that explicitly uh, endorses the prince, uh, endorses uh, maintaining or even increasing his powers. Um, there's eight MPs from uh, VU, the Patriotic Union. Uh, this is a conservative Christian Democrat party that doesn't have an explicit stance on, on the prince. Um, actually, my understanding is that um, they, they have a pretty uh, mixed um, 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 opinions of him uh, and, a, and a princely um, structure. There are four independent MPs and three MPs from uh, the Free List, uh, which is a center-left Green Party. So this is a sharp contrast to most of our countries. Uh, there's uh, only one uh, leftist party that's represented in Parliament, and they're uh, a very small minority. So uh, in practice, uh, the Parliament uh, and the monarchy share pretty much equal powers. So they can both introduce new laws or regulations uh, they can abolish uh, old laws, and they can veto each other, uh, which kind of serves as a, as a, as a check uh, between the two of them. Now, uh, on paper, the, uh, the prince actually has a tiny bit more power than the parliament, because uh, there is one thing he can do, which is uh, dissolving the parliament. He can't abolish uh, the parliament, but he can force a general election which is a right that he doesn't exercise, uh, but it exists on paper. Uh, now, all of this um, is actually subject to, na uh, to a national system of uh, direct democracy. So out of the 38,000 uh, inhabitants of Liechtenstein, you only need to get about 1,000 signatures to start a referendum, um, or 1,500 signatures if it's a referendum that would change the constitution. For example, uh, what uh, 1,500 signatures can do is uh, start a motion to uh, abolish the uh, parliament or the monarchy so the, the people can get rid of them at any uh, point in time. Um, now, that's already pretty incredible, but it gets much better than this. The national uh, government and the national system of direct democracy is uh, held in check by uh, a lot of autonomy at the local level. There's 11 villages in Liechtenstein. The smallest one is Planken with about 400 people. The biggest one is Shan with uh, 6,000 inhabitants. And uh, their membership and participation in the national government is, uh, is basically voluntary. So they, uh, they have their own local governments. Uh, they get to make a lot of their own decisions, uh, pass their own taxes, uh, industrial regulations, that kind of thing. Uh, so they don't depend on the national government on every, for everything. And this is where it gets really great. Um, each of the villages has their own system of direct democracy. And since 2003, this includes the constitutional right of secession, which means that, uh, for example, in Planken, is, uh, with 400 in inhabitants, if uh, 200 of them voted to leave Liechtenstein, Planken would be a, a sovereign, uh, independent country, which I think is really amazing. Now, um, we, I'd like to, to talk about how uh, this originated. Um, actually, the context for that was... Uh, 
In 2003, Switzerland was considering joining the European Union. There was a fairly strong movement for that in Switzerland. And um, because of the close relationship between Switzerland and Liechtenstein, the prince was afraid that uh, Liechtenstein might be pressured into joining the EU as well. And uh, he didn't want to force this upon his, uh, his citizens. He wanted uh, them to have the option to leave the, the EU, not be forced to, to join it. Um, so his in original intention was actually to give the right of secession to each and every individual in Liechtenstein, which would mean that uh, each citizen of Liechtenstein could take their homes and, and make it an independent country or voluntarily be absorbed by one of the surrounding countries. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the parliament threatened to veto this, uh, 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 this proposal, uh, so they sat down and negotiated, and they found a common ground which was giving each village the right of secession. Now, this by itself is extremely powerful, because uh, the fact that each of the villages can become independent at any time puts an incredible pressure on the national government to, to behave, to not be abusive. They, they know that they can lose their constituents if, uh, if they don't uh, govern responsibly. And this applies just as much to the prince as it does to the parliament. Um, oh yeah, so if you're like me, you might be thinking, why would a head of state advocate for individual secession? Doesn't that go against all the natural incentives that uh, a head of state has? Isn't that uh, uh, antithetical to the whole existence and purpose of government? Well, um, Prince Hans Adam has actually uh, thought about this and written an explicit response to you, if you were thinking this. He said, naturally, an anarchist could claim that a monarch from a family that has reigned for centuries cannot possibly be in favor of abolishing the state. In response, I should like to note that the princes of Liechtenstein are not paid for their duties as head of state by either the state or the taxpayer. The total cost of our monarchy, in contrast to almost all other monarchies, is covered by the princes or the princely house's private funds. So um, this kind of shows you where he's coming from, um, why he would be so uh, sym uh, sympathetic to our ideas. Now, I can hear a lot of you probably thinking, how do I move to this incredible country? I, I, I want to be part of that paradise. Well, unfortunately, it would be very hard. You probably can't. Um, only 72 residence permits are granted to EEA citizens every year, um, 17 for Swiss citizens. Um, there are several requirements, such as uh, speaking German fluently. Um, this, uh, statistical odds of uh, winning the residency lottery are actually pretty high, um, by some estimates about 60%. So if you really are dedicated to moving to Liechtenstein, you probably can make it there. Uh, but then the next step will be uh, becoming a citizen. So how do you become a citizen of Liechtenstein? That's uh, also something very interesting. Um, the naturalization process is one of the longest in the world. It's 30 years. You have to live in Liechtenstein to naturalize. Uh, but that's uh, the only solution at the national level. However, there's another solution at the local level. After living 10 years in Liechtenstein, uh, your village can vote for you to have citizenship. And that's how most people become citizens of Liechtenstein. Um, once you integrate in the, the community, people know you, they'll want you to become a, a fellow citizen. So you'll write a letter to everyone in the village, and there will be fairly promptly a, a, a local referendum on giving you citizenship. Um, so this is... Uh, yeah, possibly, yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> there's, uh, this is an excerpt from uh, uh, such a referendum that, that was held uh, last month in Shan, the most populated uh, village with 6,000 in uh, inhabitants. So uh, as you can see, the turnout was uh, about 1,100 people, uh, absolute majority around 550. Both people who applied for citizenship uh, got it. Um, obviously, there is a difference uh, in their approval rating, so that... Uh, that tells you something about their popularity in the country. Um, 
And you know that's that's how Liechtenstein is. It's a it's a civic society where um, integration in the local culture is very important. And um, you know, seeing all of this, um, so uh, national migration quotas, democratically granted citizenships, it might not sound like the kind of libertarianism you're used to. It might uh, it might sound um, like a statist solution, not free market. Well, I want to argue the exact opposite. I want to argue that this is the most free market solution that exists, simply because participation in this system is voluntary. Obviously, not a lot, not everyone may agree, not every Liechtensteiner may, may agree with the migration quotas. They may not agree with the fact that uh, abortion is illegal in, in Liechtenstein. Um, but they participate in this voluntarily. Uh, the things they don't agree with are costs which are outweighed by the benefits of participation in this society. Uh, I like to draw an analogy with uh, insurance companies. Insurance companies uh, often set out rules, uh, and um, you know they 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 uh, they charge you a different premium depending on on your risk as assessment, etc. So, for example, if uh, you're a professional skydiver uh, and you want a life insurance company, uh, life insurance uh, coverage, you might not be able to get that at all. Or if you are, um, there are probably going to be strict rules imposed upon you. Uh, the insurance company may say you can only get parachutes from this one brand that uh, we know has uh, a very low statistical uh, um, uh, rate of deaths uh, from using those parachutes. Uh, they may tell you we won't cover you if you jump uh, in bad weather. Now, of course, you don't need a life insurance to, to uh, be a skydiver, but if you um, make your income by skydiving, and you uh, support your family by skydiving, you might be worried that one day something will happen to you and, and you want your, your family to, to, uh, to, to be able to go ahead without you. So if you do uh, follow those rules and sign up to this uh, life insurance uh, 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 company, uh, you are voluntarily uh, choosing to impose those rules upon yourselves because the, the, uh, even if you may not like them, because the, the benefits outweigh the costs. And this is the philosophy of the, the princely family. That's, that's why they advocated to uh, give the right of individual secession. They say, uh, we in the princely family are convinced that the Liechtenstein monarchy is a partnership between the people and the princely house, a partnership that should be voluntary and based on mutual respect. How amazing is that? Um, but the next question is, how do we apply this in our respective countries? I mean, obviously, it works fine for a tiny Liechtenstein, for those 38,000 people uh, who are homogenous and very prosperous. But how, how do we apply this uh, in, in our lives, in our countries? Um, well, first, I would like to say that Liechtenstein wasn't always prosperous. Uh, 60 years ago, it was one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, it was mostly dedicated to farming, um, they had actually pretty bad famines. People starved in Liechtenstein not that long ago, in the last century. Um, the reason that's changed is because their government have changed, because uh, the, the, the princely house has uh, adopted a set of principles that has, has made the, pr the country prosperous. Um, now, what we need to do in our countries, how we can learn from this, is uh, see what is wrong about the way we do things, what is right about the way they do the th things, and try to, uh, to, to um, sum them up. So uh, the prince says, we are moving in the wrong direction. An expansion of the influence of the state has no place in the globalized world. Nevertheless, nationalist and socialist concepts have survived in almost all states. We should bid farewell to nationalist and socialist ideas to the extent possible and transfer more responsibilities to the citizen. We do not need more, but rather significantly less state. We must strengthen the will to engage in private solidarity and strengthen family as the foundation of society. So uh, one thing I'd like to add to that statement, based on the prince's own actions, is the fact that, um, yes, we should transfer more responsibilities to the citizen where possible. But obviously, that's not always possible. Even in Liechtenstein, you might face uh, uh, challenges such as the parliament threatening to veto you. So what we must do as libertarians, how we must 
uh, answer this is to be willing to compromise as long as the goal the, the uh, is the right goal is uh, is kept in mind that we that we know where we're going towards so uh where, when we cannot transfer more responsibilities to the citizen we should transfer more responsibilities in the direction of the citizen bring the decision making closer to each individual and uh obviously that's what they've done in Liechtenstein and that's something that we can do in each of, of our countries um even we have potential allies even on the left there are lots of leftists that uh, want more localism and that's the, the right direction that libertarian activism should be taking in we should we should uh, uh, you know forget our differences with uh, leftist people who want more localism because in the end uh, our cooperation with them sets down the, the groundwork, the framework that is necessary for a freer, more libertarian society. Um, so that's that's a lesson we can learn from Liechtenstein. I'd just like to say, um, I realize that uh, I'm saying this in what is basically the birthplace of democracy, but I would like to say that uh, democracy is flawed. Democracy has inherent problems. Um, however, I'm not going to go into what those problems are, but what I will say is that those problems are exacerbated, uh, made worse. The, big, the, the bigger is the distance between the constituent, the voter, and, uh, and the government. It does, we, regardless of whether you have direct or representative democracy, the distance is, uh, is the poison. And obviously, uh, switching from representative to direct democracy does uh, do something to uh, to reduce this, the distance between the constituent and the government, uh, but it's not enough on its own. A direct democracy on a very large scale in a very large country can be equally destructive um, because having a vast sea of, uh, of voters, of con constituents between yourselves and this decision-making is also generating a gap, a distance between yourself and, and, and the government. And this is something else that we can learn from, from Liechtenstein. It's something else to reinforce why we should fight for localism, regardless of who our allies are in, in that fight. Um, because what we need to do right now in, in the world is to shorten the distance between voters, constituents, in the individual and the government. Um, thank you very much.